I'd like to uh, provide you with uh, some sense, some appreciation for the memory uh, that is in the stone walls of New England and New York. Of course, I think we all are here uh, because we share and admire the courage, the work ethic, the struggle of the families who built uh, these walls back in the 1700s and the 1800s in this region. I have to admit, as many of you probably also do, is when we are walking in the woods and come upon these walls in the deep woods, forgotten, but not by us, appreciated by us long after those who built them have been forgotten. They've been described in, uh, in the book entitled Sermons in Stone by Susan Allport as being anonymous epics. And they are, we can appreciate that they are epical in their scale uh, because it, it has been estimated uh, that the length of stone walls in New York and New England constructed principally during the years not exclusively, but principally during the years 1775 to 1825 is when most were constructed, uh, that there are at least 250,000 miles of stone walls in New York and New England. Now, 250,000 miles should be put into some context, of course, and one of them would be it's almost the distance between here to the moon. Another way of looking at it is that it's 10 times around the equator of Earth. Uh, apparently, there were some, a lot of effort uh, went into building these. Remarkably, very little is recorded in the diaries of the, f of the families, of the farmers, of the sons and daughters, of the slaves, of the American, Native Americans who also participated in the building of these walls. Virtually nothing is written in the diaries of these people. It was, we will build a wall today. Move some stone today. I guess. I guess. That's an understatement. Yankee, a Yankee understatement. Move some stone today. Uh, they, could, they could build uh, typically a, a team of two strong men, it is suggested, could build about 10 to 15 feet of good wall a day. So we admire then their courage, the courage that is reflected in these, in these walls, uh, the struggle, uh, the passion, the passionate work ethic, and the devotion to hard work. The hills that we see around us today in this beautiful setting in, in Vermont uh, was most of these hills were populated by hill farms. And they were subsistence farmers, subsistence farmers. They did not, in general, early in these years, they did not sell their goods. They existed, they grew their crops, and they raised their livestock. And they did it for themselves, and occasionally there would be some trading, some bartering among, native, uh, among neighbors, uh, but that was largely a subsistence existence. So with that as an as a introduction now, let's take a look at, at the walls, admire them, and also appreciate a bit about uh, what they tell us. Oxen, uh, in the early years, oxen, Oxen uh, were the, the beasts, uh, the, the animals that transported most of the stone on stone sleds. Uh, they were patient animals, of course, strong as an ox, uh, we've all heard of. These were uh, resilient uh, to, uh, to the harsh climate of New England. Uh, they were much better at surviving than horses which came along later as, as uh, work animals, oxen really did it. Now, when the oxmen, oxen were done, when their lives were finished, they could also serve, of course, as supper. Uh, Professor Robert Thorson uh, from the University of Connecticut has written this. 
rural farmstead walls have become cultural icons, and I think that's why we're all here. We recognize this to be ca the case. A reminder of the slower, simpler life before the modern era. Many artists have celebrated uh, the work ethic, the self-reliance of the people who left these testaments of hard work, such as Francis Colburn. This painting is hanging, hanging in the Bennington Museum. Also by Francis Colburn, also in the Bennington Museum. The artist wanted to show that these were, these people had great dignity, that they struggled uh, for, their, for their existence in the, in the hill farms where the soil was thin, the climate was harsh, and they had to work very hard year round uh, to, to sustain themselves. They put up a great fight, and I, I honor them uh, for that great fight. It was ultimately a losing battle uh, with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. Most of these hills, of course, in New York and most of New England are now, do no, no longer have uh, farms, hill farms. Most of the walls that we observe and admire in the deep woods are farms that no longer exist because they quit. They just had to go. Uh, this is a, this, this has personal, and I'll, I'll wax personal for just a moment here. Uh, this is a mountain. What you see there is a mountain. My brother and I spent five years climbing that rock uh, when, when we were ages four uh, to 11. Uh, we climbed this rock. And we would say to our folks, mom and dad, we're going down to the big rock. And they would know where we were going. This was a country road then dirt road at the time we grew up. Our home was the last home on this road with electricity. This was virtually an insurmountable peak for, for six-year-olds. Uh, the car in the background, you can see, gives you some scale. Uh, it's, the rock is actually shorter than that. Uh, it's, it's only about six feet tall. Uh, but nonetheless, country kids trying to scale, find different avenues toward the peak, uh, kept us going for four years. That rock is nearly 30 tons, has a mass of nearly 30 tons. And of course, one would wonder, how did a rock of 30 tons uh, get there? How did most of these rocks uh, get there? Cemeteries, and we'll see in just a minute, of course, and I'm sure all of us know where they came from, uh, cemeteries were areas that were considered important by farming communities as being areas that justified excellent walls. That we would devote time and effort to building excellent walls. And here is, here is one uh, from the early 1800s. Same war, that same big rock from a different vantage point with walls uh, along this range road. This is a range road. Perhaps many of you are aware of what a range road is. When the original lots, when the original 100 to 200 acre lots were surveyed, uh, there were access roads, access pathways uh, along the boundaries of these large properties. And they came to be known as range roads. And this is a range road. You can see it's flanked by stone walls property on one side and another property on the other side. Back, uh, this, this area here was settled in uh, around 1750. Uh, we know, of course, now, uh, they didn't then, uh, where the, all these, these awful stones came from. And of course, we now know that they came from periods of great glaciations uh, uh, that and around two million years ago, uh, Earth went into an unusual set of climate swings, uh, beginning again around two million years ago. And those cycles uh, last for about 120,000 years. So we, we have not just had one epic glaciation. Uh, we have gone through, in this region here, uh, we've gone through nearly about 
15 uh, glaciations. The most recent uh, uh, ended around 15,000 uh, years ago. Uh, that's known in part from ice cores. Uh, this, this information shown here, this graph, we won't spend much time on it, uh, but this, uh, I'll look at this. This is an ice core from the Antarctic. It was global cooling, global. It happened in the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere. It was a global cooling of the Earth that began around two million years ago and went into these deep warming and cooling cycles with periods of around 125,000 years. And you're seeing this is temperature, a higher temperature on this, uh, on this here and lower temperatures here. It's possible uh, using oxygen isotopes uh, in the ice, water is H2O. O, the oxygen has three different isotopes and they can be used as proxy thermometers, uh, paleothermometers. And using those paleothermometers, you can see that it was warm back around a little over 400, this is 400,000 years ago to today. 400,000, so what was the weather 400,000 years ago? No, ask the isotopes. So we're, you can see that in warm and then gradually cooling and then quick warming. Notice the warming cycles, the warming intervals are short. And then you go back into, this is not noise. What you're seeing in these, this, this, uh, this spikiness, that is not noise, that is not data noise, that is a real climate signal. The, the data are good to about the width of the line. Uh, so then, very cold. This is just kill me now, cold. And then uh, gets warm, cold, warm, awful. Uh, this was the last, this interval here was the most recent uh, period of glaciation. Uh, that deposited the stones uh, in these hill farms. And then suddenly warmed, and we are currently in this, in this warm interval right here. So glaciation uh, was the source of all of these uh, boulders. Now when the farmers, the settlers, uh, were assigned by lot, you would draw, it would be surveyed, and then it would be, you would draw the lot. Uh, there would be a number for these various lots and you would go to a place and you would pick a number and you would know what your property, what property you'd been assigned. Sometimes it was a good day and sometimes not. As you cleared the land, of course, you needed to fence it in uh, for your livestock and this shows uh, some of the early fences uh, that would have been used along the property boundaries. For example, stumps. Uh, you would pull out, the farmers would pull out the stumps and uh, line them up and you'd have these stump, stump walls, stump fences. They would of course, like all wood, eventually rot, so they weren't permanent by any means, but at least they got you, got you cleared land, otherwise known as improved land, uh, again, walls, fences of wood would be constructed, but again, they would rot eventually, of course. And as the wood supply eventually diminished, what was left? Stone, quite a bit of stone. Uh, so the stone then ultimately became uh, the fencing material uh, for much of our region. The stumps uh, were removed uh, by, of course, a variety of methods. Uh, this one showing uh, pulleys that would just rip them right out of the ground. Uh, here we have a horse uh, winching uh, with a team, uh, winching stumps out of the ground in order to clear it uh, for cultivation. Farmers could make some extra money uh, by doing this uh, for their neighbors. Or they could trade for food or livestock. And of course, when it came to building walls, uh, we have stone sleds, large, usually oak or, or, or chestnut, 
uh, wood, heavy wood that would be pulled by oxen. Uh, you, you'd load, uh, load up these stones on the rocks, on these rock sleds, and you would ask the oxen to patiently, and they were patient, uh, pull them where you wanted, and then you would offload the rock sled uh, and build the wall that you wanted. Some walls, for example, you can find, if you go along some walls, I still haven't gotten lucky, but I still keep trying. The, if you can go along some of these walls that were built during the Oxen time in the late 1700s and early 1800s uh, with a metal detector, you may find ox shoes. Uh, when the, an oxen would throw a shoe, farmers would just toss it, toss it on the wall. Uh, and of course, uh, ox, oxen have, have different, distinctively different uh, looking shoes than horses do. No mistaking a horse shoe from an ox shoe. Uh, when you see some of these images, you'll, you will occasionally see some litter. It isn't actually litter, it was my notepad and a GPS. Uh, and that, that is just for scale, it's, it's one foot in one 12 inches in just for scale to give you some sense of it. Uh, this is a wall in my neighboring land and I thought, as Susan Alport had said, these are anon anonymous epics. I thought, I can see that they're epics. I get a sense of that as a kid and now as a grown up, I get a sense of their epical nature. But I'm not satisfied with them being anonymous anymore. So here goes my personal, my personal quest. They must not be anonymous. I want to know who built them. Before we get to that, and I'll show you my quest, uh, here is, here's a, a summary in different, around 40 year intervals of what was going on in New England, uh, New York and Western uh, New England uh, in these times. Uh, subsistence farming, eventually grading into commercial farming. Uh, during this time, transitioning from subsistence farmers, most of the walls that we see here were built by subsistence farmers. They were supplanted by commercial farmers. Those who, uh, those who could not make a living any longer, scratching out an existence in the hill towns, uh, eventually left. Many would literally go away. They would not sell, they would just leave. And what's left, of course, are cellar holes and the walls. So, increasing populations, just a little bit south of here, if you've gone, I think it's along Stratford Road, is that right, where Daniel Webster spoke, you may have seen the monument, I think it was in 1840, 15,000 people came to see, hear him speak. 15,000 in 1840. Kelly Stand. Ke Kelly Stand Road, thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly Stand Road. Kelly Stand Road, there's a monument. Again, it, it underscores that these hill towns were, had a lot of people, a lot of people working very hard in them that Daniel Webster, of course, very famous, uh, could nonetheless attract in two days 15,000 folks to hear him. Uh, migration starts to the west. The west opens up. The west did not have a lot of stones. Did not have a lot of stones. Large flat fields uh, that, could be, uh, that could be cultivated much easier. And then came the railroad and the canals, and produce from the west could be easily shipped to the east. Yes, the New England farmers had trouble competing for grain, compete, competing for the grain market, as time moved to the right here, had trouble competing uh, in the grain market in New England because of western grain coming in by rail and, can and canals. Competition was fierce. Uh, they went to sheep, sheep farming, sheep, which was eventually 
uh, changed over to cows. This is a major dairy, uh, dairy area as well. Roads and then improved roads. And of course, many of the youth said, this is darn hard work on the farm. I know that I can earn more money and work less hours on, on better conditions if I move to the city and work in a factory. Uh, so young folks uh, tended to move away from the farm and again, leaving the old folks uh, to try to scratch out a living. Uh, this, this graph here, uh, very briefly, uh, acres of improved land. Improved land, we can think of improved land as being the trees have been cleared. Uh, from, you can see, 1840 uh, to 1920, uh, Vermont. Here is shown by the green, of course, green uh, curve. Here you can see that the acreage, this is in millions of acres, so around 3 million acres growing. And then around 1880, farms are being abandoned. Things are going back to forest. Uh, you can see it's a common theme. New Hampshire, the purple, also shows a change around 1880. Same graph, I've just expanded it. New York, of course, is a big state. And this is the, so the curves that you just saw are these here. I've just ex, uh, expanded the graph to show you New York. Uh, New York also, again, in millions of acres, increased improved land, but again, also around 1880, uh, declining. And think of that then is, as the acreage of improved land, cleared land, is, going, is becoming less and less, that means it's going back to forest. The walls then, many of the walls, pastures are being reclaimed by the forest. Here it is. Here's what I would do. Dear, yes, John, I'm taking my GPS, and if it's okay with you, I'm going to spend about three hours walking in the woods. Okay, do you have your phone with you in case you get in trouble? Yes, dear. Do you, did you bring plenty to drink? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes. Well, be home by supper. I sure will, dear. So then I would just trudge out the back, back door, because we live in a fairly rural area, and I would disappear into the woods and just meander through the woods, and wow, there's a wall! And, and I would then have a handheld GPS unit, and I would take the latitude and longitude. And of course, gee, what did we do without GPS? I don't know. My, my son doesn't know how to read a map. He says, well, you know, you just GPS. So anyway, uh, I, I'm in there with my notebook and so forth, and I jot down uh, the latitude and longitude of that point where I'm on, the, on a wall. And then I would follow the wall for as long as I wanted to through the woods, taking uh, every few hundred feet or so uh, another latitude and longitude GPS point. And the several hundred points that you see on this graph is, are the points that I collected. The scale is that distance there is around 1,300 feet. You can see 1,294 feet. For scale, and that's 894 feet that way. So it gives you some sense of how much distance I covered. The dots are showing you those are the walls. This intricate, this intricate lacework of walls in the deep, this is all woods. Uh, I thought, wow, what a pattern. I wonder what it means. I wonder what it means. Who did it? What's the pattern mean, and who did it? Okay, chapter two. Let's find out who did it, and which ones might be boundaries. Boundaries. So here is this approximately where my, where my family's home is right here. And this I found in the local historical society, a map from 
uh, uh, showing the 1790s boundaries uh, of this area of the area where I live in Rensselaer County, New York. These lines then are the original 1790s boundaries of the farmers, the subsistence farmers uh, in this region. Uh, this distance from here to there might be, might say, I'll put it this way, the distance of here would be approximately uh, five or six miles, just rough scale. So here I am, right? There we are. It was John Thompson. It was the family of John Thompson. So how do I learn more about John Thompson? I know, there must have been a census. Yes, there was a census. So you go again to the local historical society and you leaf through the original census of the town from 1790. And it's not organized. It was someone in a, on a horse or in a horse-drawn cart riding along the road and jotting down as they came to a residence. Hello, I'm the local census taker. What's your name, age, and so forth, and they would jot it down. So everything was, everything was jotted down, not alphabetically. It was, who did you visit today? So now you're going through 50, 60, 70 pages of line upon line of census looking for John Thompson. In this course, handwritten. Some were good writers and others weren't. But eventually you find John Thompson. And now you're thinking, well, I wonder if what direction, what direction was the census taker going on the day that they spoke with John Thompson? Did they speak with Andreas Hahnemann and James Cleveland and Jacob Proust? Or were they going the other way? John Patchett, was that the next stop? And by golly, in the census, you know what direction on the road they were going. And now you think, oh, again, I'm, I'm just, so you do that for 18, for the next census, 1800 and 1810 and 18, 1815 and 1820 and so forth. And you see patterns. And what, what emerges is that these families stayed there. Sons, daughters, the same pattern, decade after decade after decade. It's remarkable. I know these people. I bet I know how old Anna is going to be the next census. So you go to the next census, and by golly, you find Anna's name, and she's exactly the age that you expected. Uh, anyway, if you're all geeks, that's fun. <laughs> in addition, the, uh, the census later ones, back in the mid-1800s, also did farm inventories, so you know how much corn how many pigs they had, cows, how many land, how much land was cleared, how much was still timber, how much butter they made, how many sheep they had. And it just goes on and on, the exquisite detail of these people. No longer is it anonymous. I know them. Anonymous epics, anonymous epics, and I began to sense I began to sense I knew them. They walked here. And it still gives me a, uh, gives me a chill. Uh, they walked here. And when I found, this will really sound stupid, uh, but when I find barbed wire, old, rusty, buried in the leaves, barbed wire came along, was invented around 1872, pretty close to that time where you saw the land going back to forest. What barbed wire uh, came in around 1872 is when it was first uh, invented by three inventors who competed ferociously for the market. Uh, but 
when I've come to this place, I'm following barbed wire and just, just a useless piece of information. How many different varieties of barbed wire are there? Anybody happen to know that? In which case, it's occupying too much RAM, uh, to, if you know the answer to this. There are around 1,000 uh, patented varieties of barbed wire. 1,000. Uh, anyway, when I've come to barbed wire, I see it twisted. The wire has been broken, possibly by a, a renegade cow or something, or a horse. And I see it, and I pick it up reverently, because it's been it's been rejoined. The farmer has probably captured one of the Clevelands, one of the Clevelands, captured the, the runaway cow, has returned it to the pasture, has found where that darn cow got out, and has found the broken wire, and has gone up to it, twisted the wire into a knot to repair it. And I stand and I look at that twisted wire. And I wonder if Isaac, if that's who it was, could imagine someone in the 21st century pondering his five seconds of twisting wire. He would probably say if he were young, what a fool. Uh, but I, I think um, I would hope otherwise, that I, I'm looking at it with respect. So uh, this is just a zooming in, again showing John Cleveland where we live here. This, this property has, been, has had several owners uh, afterwards, beginning in 1799. John Thompson was not here very long. Uh, New York uh, was competing, as you know, uh, for ownership of the, what is now Vermont. And New Hampshire was competing for what is now Vermont. Uh, you, made, you made a good choice in 1791 uh, of becoming a, a sovereign state. Uh, you can see the property, uh, look at the property boundaries uh, in New York. In Vermont, and oftentimes in New Hampshire, the property boundaries are just beautiful geometric shapes. This is New York. We can't get anything right. Uh, you can see it's a very complicated set of boundaries compared to what most of New Hampshire and much of Vermont have, which are very regular um, uh, geometric uh, shapes. Uh, this was also a feudal system uh, by the Van Rensselaers, who had owned this region uh, for over 200 years and leased all of this land, leased it uh, to the owners. They didn't own it. The, the, the farmers did not own it. They leased it. And they had to pay uh, the Van Rensselaers uh, labor and grain and other things every year for the privilege of, of living uh, on these properties. It was feudal. It was a feudal system. And it came to the end, to an end in around the 1840s around 1840-ish, uh, with the anti-rent wars, when the farmers, after S Stephen Van Rensselaer, one of the 10 richest uh, Americans in history, uh, estimated to have, been, have had a net worth, adjusted for inflation, of around $10 billion. At the time, he, when he died, he'd been quite a benevolent uh, feudal lord and had lapsed in the collection of the rents uh, from the farmers. Now, when he died, his, his sons said, we got a, hey, there's a lot of, lot of due, a lot of rent due out there. Let's go get it. The farmers were not enthusiastic about paying uh, many years worth of back rent. And it ultimately led to the, or led to the rent wars that ultimately led to the end of this uh, feudal system. Uh, surveyors uh, used this, uh, chains, chains, each link was 7.92 inches. A chain was 100 links, it was 66 feet long, and there would be teams of surveyors uh, which would go out with a chain and measure lengths uh, using the chain. So if you go to these, uh, uh, these, these deeds, uh, the, surveys, the surveys, you find them in links, 
um, and chains. 80 chains to the mile. And they measured things exquisitely, as I'll show you. They measured things exquisitely to a fraction of a degree with respect to magnetic direction. So I come upon a wall like this, and now have, from having seen that map that I just showed you, that black and white map, I know what that wall is. I know what that wall is. It puzzled me when I first found it because it ended. And it ended. Did they not finish it? Was it vandalized for stone to build something else? No, it was a boundary wall. They just simply wanted to put some wall here, and then they go another 100 yards or so, and then put another section of wall, and it would just made a nice line uh, for a boundary. Uh, Andreas Hahnemann uh, was on this side back in 1790. The walls were not necessarily built in 1790, but the boundaries were established in 1790s. They may have begun as stump walls, but later were into stone walls. This one puzzled me too. What? Gee, out of the nowhere was this really impressive wall What's that all about? Well, it was a triple boundary between three boundaries. That's where it was on that map. This was right there. There were very few walls here, here, or here. But right there, right there, was this great edifice of a wall that had been meticulously built. The tree has, has kind of spoiled it a bit in the last 200 years. Uh, but uh, you can see that it was, had a special purpose. It looked special when I found it, but at the time I found it, I didn't know what, it's, what it was. This is a triple boundary uh, between uh, Cleveland and uh, Proust and uh, Hanneman and Riley right here as well. So here's what the deeds look like. So I looked at the surveys. So I wanted to know who did it, who did it, and I now get the map. I know these people. I've traced the census for 90 years. I know these people, I know the families, I know their kids, I know when they die, I, I know what they're up to. And then in 1880, I lose them. They're gone. 1890 census, bad time, that census burned, so it's gone. So when I pick up the census again in 1900, and saying, okay, let's, let me find out, okay, where are these folks? None of them. This is in the hill country of Rensselaer County where I live. None of them are there. Sometime between 1800, 1880 and 1900, in that key 20-year interval, all of those families are gone. But here is, here is a, a survey report, a typical one, and I'll show you the importance of it in a minute, of the boundaries. This is what you see. Here's a boundary that is south, 70 degrees east, 70 degrees east, and it goes for a length of 17.56 chains. To a chestnut, gone and a stake in stones. So that was one of the property boundaries uh, for, for this, and this was a hainer. These were the people who lived on this land after the Thompsons left. And, the next, and then the next direction, uh, south 35 east, 40 chains to marked white oak tree. So anyway, you can see what these these, uh, these survey reports of all of I've gone to the New York State Archives. A religious experience. Uh, you go to the New York State Archives and you open the folders and there are the handwritten original survey documents. You have the map from the local historical society and now you're going to find out everything about the boundaries themselves and you go through them for days. Every one of them, just like this. In here, and they also included the surveyors, drew out the shape of the land, of uh, that boundary. And again, it was completed on Monday, June 17th, 1799. 
our home uh, that you saw previously is right about there. And here are the property boundaries uh, that were surveyed. And it was uh, segmented very quickly here, our home, current home. And there's one of two brothers, two Hainers. Uh, one was a Willemus Hainer and a Frederick Friedrich Hainer. Friedrich Hainer owned this property here, and his brother Willemus uh, owned this. Uh, Friedrich uh, was 28 years old when he died suddenly, uh, leaving a wife and five young kids, oldest eight. I know these folks. So here's my own diagram, uh, and here's, the, here's where the plot thickens. The plot thickens. So I've gone, I've walked these walls, I've walked these walls, and here are the boundaries uh, mentioned on those 1799 surveys. One of the boundaries goes north 73 degrees east, a certain number of chains, and then it goes north 35 west, and then so forth and so on. So what you're seeing here is the yellow are the directions, the magnetic compass directions done by the surveyor in June 1799, uh, and these boundaries are walled. So now you go to the walls now, and you measure their magnetic compass direction. That is shown in black. None of them are, are, none of them are close. Notice uh, this wall here, north 73 degrees east back in June 1799, but now it is north 81 degrees east. Notice that there's an eight degree, about an eight degree, eight degree compass direction different. That's big, because these surveyors were measuring things to a fraction of a degree. What's cooking? None of these, notice the bla these black numbers here, none of these black numbers agree with the yellow numbers. The yellow numbers again, June 1799, and the black numbers are effectively, you know, within the last year. Probably some of you know the answer to that. Magnetic north moves. Uh, magnetic, the magnetic compass direction drifts. That's correct, absolutely. Magnetic compass direction drifts. So now we're seeing a record between now and June 1799 at that location there, the magnetic field, the walls then are recording the compass direction, how much of a drift the Earth's compass uh, magnetic field has drifted at that location uh, in, since 1799. So these walls are remembering uh, the Earth's magnetic field uh, that in the last, uh, since 1799, uh, at that location there, uh, the Earth's magnetic field north, magnetic north, has drifted uh, eight degrees from what it was uh, back in June 1799. And I thought, darn, that's pretty neat. Holy mackerel, who would have imagined that the walls had a memory of the magnetic field? I, in fact, I've mentioned it to some of my colleagues at the university. He said, do you know what walls might remember? He said, what, what, what? I said, you're not going to believe this. They remember the magnetic field. I said, check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, John. Yeah, they, right, right. There's a punchline here, right? And no, no, really, really, sure, sure. Anyway. So anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, the true north, uh, true north we think of as being approximated by the north star, because that's related to the Earth's rotation axis. And the Earth's rotation axis in those 200-something uh, years uh, has, the Earth's spin axis has moved less than a hundredth of a degree. So the difference that we're seeing here is not related to the Earth's spin axis changing. It's related to the Earth's magnetic field. Magnetic north is wandering. 
So I thought, that's cool. That's okay, I'm on my property, on my family's property, we can now record at that location that these walls are telling us apparently that at this location over the, since 1799, the Earth's magnetic field has shifted eight degrees further west uh, than it was in 1799. But how can I generalize this? I can't ask all landowners, could I go on your land and learn about the Earth's magnetic field? Anyway, that's not going to work. So I've found something else. Uh, first, uh, geophysicists have known for quite a while uh, that the Earth's magnetic field does indeed drift. And they have done Herculean work uh, to constrain the path, the drift path of the Earth's magnetic field. And they've done it not using stone walls. They did it here. For this, just this interval here from 1750 to 1799, you can see that here's Asia and Europe and North and South America here, just for scale on this map. This is from a 2000 publication in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. It's a team of really robust uh, geophysicists. And they used those points. What are those points? Those are ship's logs. Sailing ships who the navigator would go on board at a certain time and say, well, here we are, we think. Uh, we don't know much about longitude at this time. We're in a ship in the Indian Ocean, in the Indian Ocean here, and we've just taken a compass bearing. And they went through 40,000 log entries. 40,000. The geophysicists went through 40. Thousand log entries in order to construct a cloud of data that might uh, have a record the drift of the Earth's magnetic field. It's astonishing what they did. All these points, of course, are quite inaccurate because navigation at the time was not nearly as good as GPS is on land now. So here is Jackson et al. Here's the latest Model 11 magnetic declination. Declination is the difference between magnetic north and the spin north, the spin axis and the magnetic north. The difference, and that's the degrees here. Degrees, how much of a, how much of a difference is there? And this, the blue curve, is for our property, our property, uh, based on Model 11, beginning in Jackson et al. 2000, this is what the Earth's magnetic field has done according to that Herculean effort uh, that they put in with sailing ships, is the blue line. Guess what the red, guess what the red bars are? The stone walls. The stone walls. Surveys were taken back in 1966 of a particular wall. I looked at that surveyor's report and found out what the magnetic compass direction was of that wall back in 1966. Anyway, just all sorts of things for that. So uh, notice that for our property, the stone walls then uh, provide really good, I think you can see not perfect, but good agreement with the uh, geophysical uh, data. Right, you can see a pretty good correspondence. I have to admit uh, with some immodesty uh, that the Stonewall data are better uh, than the Herculean effort uh, done by the, uh, the geophysicists back in 2000. So I thought, geez, I'd love to be able to generalize this and look at other properties real quickly. So in the last minute or three that we have, I want to show you what we've done. Uh, what I've done, and I've used LIDAR. LIDAR is light detection and ranging. We've heard of sonar, sound navigation and ranging, and radar, radio detection and ranging. Well, LIDAR is light detection and ranging. Thanks. And, that, and that's been done uh, for many states uh, by airplanes using lasers. 
lasers. These planes fly over, fly over, putting tens of thousands of laser pulses per second. Tens of thousands of laser pulses per second as they're flying along, tens of thousands, and they're doing the round trip travel time of light between the pulse to the ground, back to the detector. Technology is just dizzying. Dizzying. And it's LIDAR maps. And they can reflect off trees, they can reflect off leaves, but some of the lasers get through to the ground. So you can use software to say, I'd like to look at the ground. I don't want to look at the, I don't want to look at the leaves. So you can make the forests disappear. Can you imagine? Let's make the forests disappear. So uh, Johnson and co-workers, here's what the land, particularly this is a publication, this is what an area of Connecticut looked like in the winter. This is what it looked like in the summer. And this is what it looks like with LIDAR. Same patch of land. And if you look carefully, you can see, what are those? Those are stone walls. Those are stone walls. They are, you cannot see them from the air because the trees, you couldn't see them really that way either. But the LIDAR, boom, just pops it. Isn't that cool? That is just so cool, I can't stand it, you know? <laughs> and it's, so uh, here, was an, here was a way of being able to access vast properties uh, without having to knock on the door and plead with a homeowner to allow you to walk their walls with a handheld GPS. So now just from having ex run the experiment on my own land, in my neighbor's land, and found that magnetic field drift could be recorded apparently in the walls, let's start exploring other states. So here is the LIDAR of our land, just to get you back uh, to it. Uh, that is our house and rock garden right there, right at the tip of the arrow. And here are the walls uh, that I had meticulously uh, walked. This is the north. That wall right there is the north 75 degree, 45 minute west uh, wall that you had previously seen. And you can see there are a whole bunch of walls all over the place. And of course, they were in that crude map that I had drawn earlier. This is available in Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, uh, Maine, all of LIDAR is everywhere. And you can do it just a remarkable, uh, do a lot of things with it. And the last slide, uh, this is just another Pembroke, uh, New Hampshire. Here is what the, here's what the uh, plots look like uh, when it was laid out these properties in Pembroke, New Hampshire, just to name one property I've looked at here, one town. 1728 was when those surveys occurred, 1728 to 1730. And here's a map, here's a river, and there are the properties. And you can see, as I had mentioned before, compared to New York, which had this hodgepodge of geometries. Uh, notice, notice beautiful geometries here. So let's take a look. Let's take a look, and, and that direction there was north 25 degrees west. That's what their surveyors, that's what the, uh, the proprietors uh, said. We will lay out a town, uh, um, didn't call it a town at the time, but we will, we will lay out this, and that'll be the compass direction. North 25 west, north 65 east. Surveyors go out there and block it out. So here is, here's an aerial view of a region of, of Pembroke, New Hampshire, and if you look down at that, you can say, I think I see a pattern. In fact, that is the Fourth Range Road right there, Fourth Range Road, and you can see remnants of fields. There's probably a stone wall there, what do you bet? And it probably goes off here, but there's forest, and forest, and so forth, but you get a sense that this Fourth Range Road and other range roads are, are preserved from the original 1730 uh, surveying of that of Pembroke, New Hampshire. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the LIDAR. Same view. And just remind you, see that little pond there? That's a pond. There's the pond. And this was woods. 
Look at the pattern of walls. Uh, now forgotten, of course, but there are the pattern of walls uh, in, 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 in the woods of, of uh, Pembroke, New Hampshire. So you measure, you measure their directions uh, from LIDAR. Bingo, put it on the drift curve from Jackson et al. 2000 for that particular region, which is different than for New York's area. And bingo, it, it maps right on to the uh, Model 11. Again, not with 40,000 data points, but with fewer than 100, and with much higher accuracy. So I'm now in Nova Scotia, mapping Nova Scotia with LIDAR and so forth. Uh, and it's checking the model. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the geophysicists, when they review my paper, will say, wow, this is incredible. Why didn't we think of this? Uh, so stone walls, stone walls have remarkable memories. These were made by subsistence farmers. I look at, I, I deal with reverence at these walls, as you must also. I was not content uh, with having them be anonymous epics. I wanted to know them. And with efforts of census, being meticulous with census, I know these folks. And some days I visit their graves and I say hi. In conclusion then, I end with this wall here because I think it was a corner foundation for a large barn, the cemetery for this, for this family, the West family, back in 1760, is just 100 yards to the right. Again, I know these folks. And I look at this wall. This pad of paper, remember, is one foot across. And I stood, as I found this wall, I saw it on LIDAR. I said, what the is that on LIDAR? I've got to see what that is. And you tromp through the woods, and you come upon this. Wow. Wouldn't we have enjoyed watching? I doubt if they would have wanted us to watch. Get over here, you know? <laughs> uh, uh, look at the size of these stones. Again, a testament to their industry, struggle, courage, and devotion to hard work. Thank you very much. <laughs>